Let's actually, let's start with a, with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy home, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Okay, it is so good to be with you today. I did not expect this. I thought a handful of people, man. So just a little bit about me personally. So I'm from Oklahoma, and I know back in the day, all right, there used to be a big time rivalry between the University of Oklahoma and the University of Nebraska. I know there was, there's kind of this, right? Well, I'll have you know I am not with the University of Oklahoma. My hometown is Stillwater, which means I bleed orange. <laughs> Go Cowboys. Um, I grew up in Stillwater, I was born in 1984, public school, raised Catholic, played baseball in high school, loved to fish, um, was involved with high school things. Um, and when I was 20 years old, at that point, I just could not stop thinking about being a priest. It would not leave me alone. Dated, was in, had a job. I was at a Mexican restaurant. You know the, the window at a Mexican restaurant where the guy is, flips tortillas, makes tortillas in the window? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Very important job, the tortilla technician. Anyway, <laughs> that was me. Uh, became a seminarian, lived in Minnesota, St. Uh, John Vianney Seminary in Minnesota for two years, um, and then Rome, Italy for five years, where I overlapped with Father Neil Hope, very dear friend of mine, and also Bishop Hannafelt was one of the priests on faculty at the time. Um, was ordained in 2011, was an associate pastor in a parish right in Tulsa, um, and also chaplain at our Catholic high school called Bishop Kelly. Um, so I, for those of you who are in high school ministry, I feel your pain, okay? I feel your pain. I was then a pastor um, in a town about 45 miles north of Tulsa called Bartlesville. Um, maybe you've heard of Phillips 66 or Conoco Phillips. They, they got started in Bartlesville. I was there as a pastor. Um, they had a, a school, pre-K through eighth grade school. Um, again, if you're in a Catholic school, I feel your pain, you know? A um, lot of blessings and a lot of, lot, of, lot of challenges as well that come with that. Since 2017, um, I was made the vocation director of the diocese. And so now I'm, so I am not actually in a parish. I am not in a school. I'm not a campus minister. I don't really do baptisms anymore, funerals, weddings, annulments, thanks be to God. Like I don't, I have one job in the diocese of Tulsa. And that is young men who are thinking about the priesthood young ladies who are considering the religious life. My job is to accompany them and to hear them, to hear their stories, to make sure they have good resources, to make sure they know what a next step would be, to help them realize, is this for them or is it not for them? And that also includes working with our seminarians as well. We have 17 seminarians. Um, they're all brats, but you know, <laughs> I do oversee uh, the, the seminary formation. Speaking of this as well, okay. I now have three microphones, but I'm not giving up my laser pointer, okay? I'm still holding that. Um, okay, so, so since 2017, basically every day, hearing stories from young men and women who are discerning the priesthood or religious life, right? That's a lot of, that's a lot of people to talk to. Um, and so over time, just hearing them, we've kind of narrowed it down uh, as far as like what, what they want, <laughs> questions they're going to have, fears they're going to have, hesitations they're going to have, um, things that really excite them and get them kind of pumped up about this. We've, we've kind of narrowed it down at this point. It's not, um, it's not really guesswork. Um, and it's just a ministry that I really, really um, enjoy. Um, okay. I like this talk. You each should have a sheet of paper now that is called... How it happens, right? How it happens. Um, there's two sides to it. One is discerning a call to the religious life. One is discerning a call to the priesthood. We're, for the purpose of our conversation today, we're going to focus on the one on priesthood, okay? But the same talk, 90% of it is going to be the same um, regarding religious life. But for our purposes today, we're going to focus in on that. Everyone here knows priests. You know priests. Um, and you've probably heard them say things like this. 
I, I discerned a call to be a priest. And you probably went like this. Oh, cool. Right? You've heard like, yeah, I discovered, I discovered, back in the day, I discovered I was, I was supposed to be a priest. And you probably went, oh, awesome. But if anybody were then just to push it just a little bit and say, what did that look like? You'd probably go, I don't know. I guess the phone rang, you know? You answered the call. Is that kind of Whippy Goldberg from uh, Sister Act, you know? Oh, the call, yeah, the call. Anyway, <laughs> right? Like, when we get down to it, priests, we, we're good about, or we're kind of sneak at actually. Like, we, we use language often that, that we know and understand and live and breathe, and we just sort of presume that everybody else understands. And sometimes that's um, to our unfair advantage. I mean, you know, we, we, we presume, and um, sometimes they don't know what we mean. So in this talk today... We're going to like focus in a little bit and look at how it happens, how it is practically on a day-to-day, what it looks like when a young man discovers that he has been put here by God to be a priest. Does that make sense? We're going to walk through kind of step-by-step of what that looks like. The phone does not ring. It's a text message, actually. (laughs) Just kidding. Almost never does the clouds, like, form in a certain way. And it's like the Blessed Mother's face, and she says, be a priest. Like, almost never does an owl swoop in, deliver a letter, like in Harry Potter, and say, you've been summoned to Hogwarts Seminary. Please arrive on August 15th, et cetera. Almost never does that happen. Ladies and gentlemen, this is how it happens. This is how it happens 99% of the time. This is not some, this is an important point before we dive in. This is not some Father Pratt gimmick. I didn't sit down one day and go, wouldn't it be really helpful if we like created a way people became priests and then created this chart? That's not how, it, this happened through talking with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of seminarians and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of priests about how they discern this call. And almost all of them, this is, this is not a creation, this is an observation. Does that make sense, the difference? Of what takes place, and what we did was capture it, put it on one sheet of paper, try to make it clean and simple in order to, to communicate that. So this is more like an observation. Think of like two people falling in love, right? No one taught them how to do that. that just, it's almost by nature. Right? Discovering a call to be a priest, it just sort of happens this way. Does that make sense? Okay. You guys are on the front. I mean, as parish leaders, Catholic schools, RCIA, like youth ministers, volunteers, you're like on the front lines. And so I'm really excited to, to talk with you because you know what? They're in your parishes. They're in your parishes. Here we go. You want to know how it happens beginning to end? No? Nobody? Nobody wants to know? One? All right. I guess for one, we'll do it, you know? Okay. So, a man discovering a call to be a priest. We're going to walk through step by step. It almost never, people, it almost never starts with a, he wakes up in the morning and goes, I want to be a priest. With all my heart, almost never. Usually, there's a pre-step here, like over here, you know, where they've gotten really involved with their Catholic faith. They're in your youth groups, they're in your Catholic schools, and they have learned about their Catholic faith, and they love it. (laughs) They really like being Catholic. Something happens, step number one, something happens, and it's almost imperceptible, that they almost just catch themselves with like thinking about what would that be like? What would it be like to be a priest? They're probably at mass and fathers up there preaching and they almost like without even any sort of, the only nudge is from the Holy Spirit. They catch themselves going, I wonder if like, I wonder what that would be like to be, to preach or to hear confessions. It's a curiosity. And just like that, the door is open. Maybe it happens in adoration. 
Maybe it happens through some, someone in, says, hey, I think you'd be an awesome priest one day. And they all, they, all of a sudden, the door just opened a little bit, and now they're curious about this way of life. It is nowhere near a desire at this point. That's important. That's important. It's not a desire. This is an organic growth that takes place. Think of our Lord's parable of the mustard seed, right? When it starts off very small, goes into the ground, and then over time grows into something large. That's how a person discovers the vocation. At this stage, it is totally very small. They don't even know they're discerning at this point. They're just simply open to the fact or curious about the priesthood. Then what begins step number two? They become what we jokingly call cyber discerners. They're telling nobody about this. They go online and they like start Googling what, what is a priest? What does a priest do? Why do they wear black all the time? Why celibacy? Why obedience? What do they do during the week? What is a seminary? What is going, so they just, maybe like at mass, they'll see like a vocations pamphlet on a shelf and they'll go, Right? They're not telling anybody about this. They kind of feel like they're from Mars, but they're interested. They want to learn more about what this way of life is like. And so they, step number two, they're just going to research. They're going to find pamphlets. They're going to read books. They're going to look at Bishop Barron videos. They're going to look at Father Mike Schmidt's videos. They're going to go on all kinds of vocations websites. They're going to poke around galore and go, what exactly, what exactly is this? Again, if you were to ask them at this point, do you want to be a priest? They're going to say, nope. Nope. But they're researching, right? This is a part of the discernment process. Almost always, step number three, almost always there's a priest in the picture that they got to know personally. Almost always. Usually it's their local pastor. Maybe it's their campus minister. Father Neil Hoke is at the University of Nebraska Kearney, for example. Um, maybe it's their associate pastor. Somewhere along the line, a priest took time to give them attention. And maybe took a little more time with them in the confessional, for example. Or talked to them after Mass. Or went to their ball games. Or just spent time with them. Almost always, the young man gets to know a priest on a personal human level. And they realize he actually has a hometown. He, like, came from that parish. And I'm, like, from two parishes over. Turns out, Father Hope goes on vacation, right? He likes, he likes to read. He like has these hobbies and things. He has friends. He has a mom. By the way, your mom is here today, right? Where is she? Please stand up. There she is, the mother of Father Neil Hope. She promised us last night we were all hanging out and and she said, like, if everybody else boos, I will cheer, all right? <laughs> Good mom. Good mom, right? But there's a human element there. That it turns out he, like, comes from families. He has hobbies. He likes things. He played sports. He like, he plays, he's, a, he's an artist, maybe. He likes history. There's hobbies there. And what that does is it tells the young man, wow, priests are, like, actually people. He's been this figure up behind the altar my whole life at Mass, wearing weird, strange robes. Like, I don't know, it's kind of hard to connect. Maybe he's 30 years, 40 years older than me. But now, like, turns out, he, like, he's, a, he's a human being. And without even knowing, they make the mental jump that God calls people to be priests and religious. And that right there is a big step in them going, wow, God called, like he could, he could call me. He could ask me to join that convent or to become a priest. Like God calls human beings. This step right here, almost always there's a, there's a priest in the picture, and that does so much to help them discern this way of life. It just makes it more human. Does that make sense? Number four, almost always, almost always, they like get off the sidelines regarding their Catholic faith 
and they do what we call exercise faith muscles, right? They're going to be like your leaders in your youth group. They're going to be like the head altar server at your parish who's like serving Easter with all those kind of longer, more complicated masses. He's like, I'll do it, right? He likes being up there. They're going to be like organizing friends to do, go to this pro-life thing or a service project. Or you're going to see him passing out things to the homeless, unprompted. You're going to see him hanging around the church. You're going to, maybe they're going to do something more involved. They're going to go on like mission trips for a whole week and serving, and like serving people. Or teach totus to us for a whole summer. Or become a focused missionary for two years. Or tech or something like that. Like they are, they are actively helping people with their faith. And they like it. A lot. They love their Catholic faith. And now they really enjoy helping people with their faith as well. You can see an early priest heart starting to form, to bud. That little seed that started off as small and imperceptible is now maturing and growing. Almost always, they're going to exercise, they're going to be exercising their faith muscles. They're going to be involved with their faith. Almost never do they sit in the room all day long, no contact with anybody, don't go to anything churchy, and they're like, I'm going to be an awesome priest. Never. You're going to see him probably out getting his hands dirty. At some point, step number five, they realize this creature exists called the vocation director. And every religious order has one. Every diocese has one. That's me and the Diocese of Tulsa. Yours is Father Neil Hoke. And they are the point person to accompany people in this process. And they hear that we hear their stories. We support them. We encourage them. We pray for them. We invite them to gatherings. Almost, and sometimes, guys, it's, it, honestly, it's a, it's a no right away. You meet them. And for whatever reason, they're not, they cannot do this. They're not, God did not give them what it takes to do, to be in this religious order. And there's, that's a longer conversation, um, but a necessary one that's, not everybody is called to be a priest. And that's just the reality. And so there's some screening that happens right here. Um, but 98% is not, 98% is encouragement and support and prayer and invitation. Uh, but they're going to meet the vocation director who's going to be the church's official representative to sort of accompany them through this process. Number six, they're going to meet other discerners. This is a big deal. You guys know young people really want to belong. They really want to belong. And if they feel lonely or if they feel like they're the only one, even if everybody else is jumping off that cliff, they're like, okay, I guess I'll just jump off the cliff, right? I'd rather like do what everybody else is doing rather than be kind of by myself. It takes Anyway, it's kind of hard for them to do so when they are, at this point, 16 to 25 years old is going to be like 90% of them. If they're that age, and they are still practicing their faith, most of their peers have left, by the way. They already feel kind of lonely in just that they still call themselves Catholic. Now, they're actually pretty devout Catholics. They probably go to daily mass on occasion, which they may have a sense of loneliness about that itself. Now, you mean to tell me I might be called to be a priest? or a nun, and they look around and they don't see anybody else around them asking questions about celibacy or considering giving up a career in order to just help people with their relationship with God. Their peers are not asking those questions. That could be really hard on young people. That could be really hard on them. And so when they meet other discerners, maybe they join a discernment group, for example, or they go with Father Neil to a seminary, and all of a sudden they see 50 other guys who are also asking the same questions. Or they go to a retreat or a holy hour that's put on that's specific for vocations, and then all of a sudden they see a bunch of people supporting them and other people who are like, yeah, I, I don't know. I always thought I'd get married, but now I'm, I have this tug to become a priest. And they're like, oh my gosh, I thought I was the only one on earth. You too? Like, Yeah man, can we talk? That's a big deal to them. Young people want, and quite frankly, need to belong. They need to belong. And so for them to meet other people who are in this process is no small thing. It's no small thing for them. So the Diocese of Tulsa, we like encourage that. We've sort of gone all in on discernment groups. <laughs> 
groups of five or eight here, five or eight there, um, that they can sort of track together throughout this process. We put a lot into that because that is such, such a big deal for them. Then there's the application process. Let's say they go through all that, and they're still, they've researched, they're open about it, they've researched, they've gotten to know a priest, they've exercised their faith muscles, they met Father Hoke, Father Hoke didn't say go away. They visited a seminary, they really like it, and then they, gosh, you know, maybe I need to like, maybe I need to like make the plunge and dive in. There's an application process. That's, that is, that's, that's where some real vetting happens. We don't just let anybody in. We want people who have the potential, at least the potential, who can go into your parishes and be loving pastors. If they do not have that potential, they shouldn't become seminarians, at least not right now. Maybe in a couple years, yes? So that, this is some, some difficult conversations happens. Usually it's very joyful, though. There's some vetting, there's a psychological evaluation, there's a physical, there's autobiographies, there's interviews, they sit down with the bishop. It's like a big deal. It usually takes two or three months to, to simply become a seminarian. That's kind of a, that's, pretty, that's a pretty serious vetting. And like Sam mentioned, this, because the vetting has gotten better, the seminaries have gotten better. There's other factors too, but health here results in more health here in the seminary. There's other factors too. Also, healthy environment, healthy semin seminaries attract guys who go visit and go, wow, I could see myself like growing in my relationship with God here. Healthy seminaries also attracts future seminarians. They're kind of complementary in that sense. Okay, let's say they go through all that and they go through the application process and they happen to catch Bishop Hannafelt on a nice day. <laughs> they just, one out of a million, right? And he says, sure, why don't you become a seminarian for us? We'd love to have you. Thus begins, really, this is sort of the beginning phases of discernment. Okay, one through seven, that's sort of the beginning phases. They're high school, they're in high school, they're college age, they're young adults. Then they make the plunge. They dive, and they dive into the pool. Now begins formal, formal discernment as a seminarian. And this is where it kicks up a notch, kicks up about 10 notches, actually. Now, they used to live at home where they had a job or they're in high school, or now they live with other, they move into a seminary building. Think of like a dorm room, a big dorm, college dorm, and there's 50 to 100 seminarians that live in that dorm. And there's a chapel on the bottom floor that they all meet with. They, they have morning prayer together, mass together, holy hours together, evening prayer in their house, right? They go downstairs, boom, there's the big chapel right there. They have meals together every day. They have service opportunities every week that they're like going to nursing homes, they're teaching Bible studies, they're, visit, they're serving the poor, they're working in youth groups. They are going to daily mass. They have a spiritual director they meet with every other week to talk about their faith life. They're studying the catechism. They're living with other priests. They're living with other seminarians. They're growing in the spiritual life. They are swimming in it at that point, right? They are in, this is priest school. They may behave like they're in preschool. <laughs> this is priest school, right? They're in it all year round, okay? And it's awesome. I work with seminarians all the time. I was in seminary for six years. Like, that's a great, when you're, if you're thinking about, if you want to be an architect, you can only sit around and talk about it for a while. Eventually, you got to go to architect school, right? And then there, there's some weeding out that happens. You talk with professionals. You talk with other people. And some people then go on to become architects. If you're interested in becoming a teacher, eventually, you got to go study education. you got to declare that major and make the plunge, say no to everything else for the time being, and dive in. And through that process, you realize, turns out, I hate kids. <laughs> I'm not becoming a teacher for the next 45 years. Get off of me, you know? Like, you're all going to the principal's office the rest of the year. Right? Like, you, you don't know that until you sort of make the plunge and dive in. That's what seminary is it's priest school where they make the plunge and they are growing in their faith. They're learning about our Catholic faith. They're serving galore. They're having conversations all the time about the spiritual life. They have priests who've been plucked out of their parishes, out of their diocese, 
specifically to invest in the future priests of the church, handpicked for this job specifically. That, the first step in seminary, they're studying philosophy. That step alone, number eight, takes two to four years, depending on how much college education they had ahead of time. That alone is two to four years. Then things kick up a notch. They go to step number nine, where they primarily, it's a lot of the same things, living, living with other priests, diving in, etc. Now, however, they're studying theology. They're going to have like a whole college course on the Gospel of John. Like, talk about diving in. They have like a whole college course on the Eucharist. Doesn't that sound great? No? Doesn't? Sounds great to me. All right. Like, church, I mean, diving into church, like a whole course on like medieval church history, right? It's very specific and deep so that they are like begin to start to think with the mind of the church that when they go into parishes, they can help the people become awesome, stinking Catholics. That's the end goal. And so this stage alone, while they're in this second step of seminary, it's called studying theology, they're also taking practicums in like, hom- like, like preaching hom- how to preach a homily. Some should have studied more in that, you know? <laughs> Did I say that out loud? How to, you know, how to do a funeral, how to do a baptism, how to say mass. So in this stage, they're like diving into like, I don't know, the theology of baptism. In this stage, it's like, how do I do a baptism? (laughs) I'm going to be a priest soon. How do I make Catholics? Like there's logistics involved with that as well, right? There's the spiritual and teaching part, but there's also like, they need record, baptismal records and things like that. Okay. So then that stage alone, number nine, at a minimum, minimum is four years. Four years at a cost of about $40,000 a year per seminarian. That's a lot. That's a lot. At the, end, at the beginning of their fourth year, they're ordained a deacon, a transitional deacon. And at the end of that, they spend one year as a deacon. And then at the end of that, after all that, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, rather, eight, nine, all right, that's intended to... So there's a lot of time there, you know. <laughs> then, by the grace of God, that's for reasons known to God alone, they kneel before Bishop Hannafelt, and just like we see in the New Testament, he extends his hands and places them on the priest's head, and the bishop prays. And when that man stands up and he finishes praying, he's now a priest. He is now, three minutes before, he could not hear your confession. He could hear it. He couldn't do anything about it. (laughs) After that happens, his job is to hear confessions. His job is to say mass. Ten minutes before that moment, he could pray all the prayers he wanted over bread, and it would do nothing. After that moment, this moment right here, he is a priest. Is. This is not just his career. He is forever. And when he says those words of, of consecration, that's no longer bread he's holding. That's now the presence of Christ. At that moment, when Bishop Hannafel ordains him a priest, the discernment process is over, right? He's no longer asking, well, should I be a priest or shouldn't I? No, he, it's done, right? Now the question is, how do I be a saintly priest? Given the bishop's orders that he's given me, how do, I, how do I bring the presence of Jesus to every person that I've been assigned to? No longer like, is this for me or is this not for me? I don't really know. Maybe I didn't really discern. Nope. The discernment process at that point is totally over. It began by them getting involved with their faith at some point, some magical moment, beautiful, graceful moment that maybe they remember and maybe they don't remember. I actually don't remember thinking about it for the first time. But I did at some point. And that kicked off this whole process of reading about it, getting to know priests, getting very involved in my faith, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way to July 9th, 2011, when Bishop Slattery, 
ordained me a priest, and he has regretted it ever since. <laughs> but that, good people, is how it happens. When, we say, when you hear your priest say, I discerned a call, like, that's what happened. That's what happened on a practical, day-to-day -day parish level. Let's just take one kind of, kind of pause for now. There's a few more words I want to say about that. Um, but any kind of questions at this point? Yeah. Quick one. Junior high kids, they claim at one time it was like 25, 30% think about it, but it doesn't go to step two, the research part. Is that number still the same? And again, that's kind of back a while back. What are the current numbers showing? What are we seeing with kids when they're just curious about it? What's yeah. the level of age, whatever? Because things are coming down younger now. Yeah, right, right. Today? Yeah, a question is like, like how many kids or kind of what percentage of, uh, of young people, even like children, Think about being a priest. And there's kind of like two, two levels to that. Okay, so there's like, there's children who, who on Monday, like, are, really want to be a priest and like are playing mass and are like setting up things in the living room and like they want to be, and it's, it's beautiful. And their parent is like, oh my gosh, awesome. Like my child wants to be a priest. On Tuesday, they want to be like a garbage man, you know, like. <laughs> And on Wednesday, because they saw that big, awesome truck drive by, they're like, I want to drive that. Like, my brother famously wanted to be a garbage man for the first 10 years of his life. But my mom was like, there's other options, you know, there's other options. Anyway, so there's kind of, you know, there's the, we don't want to dismiss it as something childish, because it may be something real, but, but knowing that children are children, right? So there's that. Really, up until... I don't, I don't really get involved, really, until they're probably 15 or 16 years old. That's kind of my cutoff. It was one, if they're 16 and still thinking about it, um, then that's where the vocations office starts offering things for them. Seminary visits, discernment groups, things like that. Before, when they're still like pretty young, the best place for them is, is, is in their families, right? Family support, their local youth group, um, mass on Sunday, going to confession. That's a great place for them. As far as percentages go, I don't really know like what percentage, you know, that's kind of a hard question to answer. But anyway, yes, sir. So in our diocese, um, the Diocese of Tulsa, I don't know if it's the same here, but just regarding our seminarians, a third of our seminarians are from Catholic schools. Um, which is disproportionately really high compared to how many, a third of our Catholic kids in our diocese do not go to Catholic schools, right? That's, a, I don't know, it's probably like, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's going to be very small, maybe like 5 to 10% of our Catholic kids go to Catholic schools, yet a third of our seminarians are from Catholic schools. So they're going to have a better, a higher reach there. Um, that being said, there's sometimes it can, anyway, this is, that's kind of a longer conversation of it. Sometimes it can work against them. They've been, they've been in Catholic school their whole life, and now they're totally done with it, you know, and they want to leave, and they want nothing to do with it for a while. And that's unfortunate, but that does, that does sometimes happen. Um, so anyway, whenever they come back and go, okay, I'm ready to have the conversation, then I'm there, right? But in the meantime, like, you know, he graduated from a Catholic high school, goes to college, <laughs> Gone, right? Gone. And wants nothing to do with church until um, maybe he, like, has a kid or is getting married. And is now like, maybe there are, like, I should get serious about, like, being a responsible adult um, or something, you know. But anyway, that's a longer conversation, though. Okay. Yes, one more. Where does the question of the ask, the questioner, yep. Stay tuned for the talk at the end of the day. <laughs> the inspiration talk towards the end, um, we're going we're gonna to hit that exactly. But just real quick, that usually, that's somewhere probably in here, even here a little bit, right? or pretty early on. Okay. So a couple points about this chart. One through six, or really I would say probably yeah, probably one through six can actually happen in any order. It might be they taught totus to us for the summer and spent the whole summer doing holy hours, rosaries, helping young people grow in their faith. 
And that's really what gets them going, wow, I actually really like serving the people of God. Maybe I should think about this, right? Or maybe like they got to know a priest was close with their family growing up, and he's the one, either asked them about it, or he's the one that inspired them, and boom, now that starts this whole, or maybe he got roped into it, he never thought about it, this has actually happened, it's kind of fun. Um, they never thought about being a priest at all, but like his buddies were going on the seminary visit, and they're like, come on, just go, it'll be fun. And so he went along, not interested in the least bit, and then he's like the one that like, you know, anyway. So these, these can actually happen really in any order. This is not, this is probably like most typical, but yeah, does that make sense? So those can happen really in any order. Once it gets to here, the application process through here, there's no skipping around with that. You don't like become a seminarian for three years and then Father Hoke's like, oh wait, we gotta do your application process first. Like, <laughs> never, right? That never, that never happens. Um, okay, some misconceptions. And this is where you can be big in your parish, okay? Now that you sort of know, which is how this pr process happens, look at like how much discernment happens right here as a seminarian, two to four years, and then another four years. So it takes anywhere from six to eight years from this point of discernment and formation to become a priest. Religious orders is gonna be the same thing. Anywhere from six to nine years in order to become, to take final vows and become a religious sister. That's a long time. Here's a big misconception that you as parish leaders working with youth, Catholic schools, can clear up. In their minds, discerners will often go, okay, when I am 100% sure I'm called to be a priest, then I'll join seminary. When in reality, you join seminary to answer that question, right? The equivalent of that is saying, when I'm 100% sure I'm going to marry that girl, then I'll ask her on a date. That's the equivalent. But you guys hear that and you're like, duh, that is not how, that's not how it happens. That's not how this happens either, okay? Consider this like the getting to know you phase, all right? In a, if we're gonna use a dating analogy, let's stick with that for a second. This is like, tell me your name. Tell me about your family. You smell really good. Like, <laughs> you wanna get some ice cream? Do you wanna like, can I tell you about me? This is like a, you're spending more and more time together, getting to know each other, and it like turns out to be pretty good, right? Pretty good. At some point, though, you go, listen, I like, I like you. I like you a lot. And I don't know if we're called to get married. But I do know I, I, I want to spend a lot of time with you. And I'm actually not looking at any other woman in the world. Right now, I just, I wanna, I wanna focus on you. And in this process, we're gonna get to, you're gonna get to know me really well, I'm gonna get to you know, know you really well. We're gonna share some things, it's gonna be beautiful. In that process, we may realize that we're like, we should get married. Let's make a lifelong commitment out of this. We also may realize, you hate my guts. <laughs> I drive you crazy, right? That, that right there, that, okay, let's make this exclusive, is kind of, this is a loose analogy, but that's this right here. When the guy says, I'm no longer thinking about being an architect or a teacher or, or, or even really getting married, like it comes across, but right now, my focus, my fo I want to see if this is for me. I want to dive in and live with other priests and live with other seminarians and study the faith deeply and do ministry things on a daily basis so that I, I'm like swimming in it. And if the shoe doesn't fit, good. It's not for me then. I think it's about 50%. I think when it all said and done, 50% of those that become seminarians actually go on to become priests. 50%. And Father Hope will attest, we're like really happy about that. If a guy throws himself in, becomes a seminarian for a year or two years, even longer, and then realizes this is not for him, he has just gotten awesome Catholic formation and will probably go back to his parish and be a ridiculously good parishioner 
That's going to inform his marriage, how he raises his kids. That's a, that's a net positive for the church, for sure. That's a positive thing. Sometimes when they leave, we're like, oh, man, he could have like been so good in a, like as a parish priest. He would have been great. Um, and sometimes we're like, okay, bye-bye, you know. <laughs> you have time. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking about leaving. Okay, sign here. Good, you know. But about 50% of the time, they, they don't become priests. And that's, like, that's actually a net positive, right? And so when you are talking with people, when you notice people, we'll talk about this later, later on in our talk. But just know, these are steps. These feel like huge, giganto steps to them. And they are at that phase. But in the grand scheme of things, they're actually not that, they're not that big. They may go, oh my gosh, like, I've been invited to go visit a seminary. That means I'm going to be a priest. And you say, no, it doesn't. It means you're going to be gone from Friday to Sunday. And you're going to go look at a seminary. And you may come back afterwards and go, it's not for me. Um, so you can really help them see that their, these early steps are, are, are big and feel big to them. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, if they become a seminarian, they will have six to eight years of prayer and priest help along the way to help them realize this is for them or not. Right? That's a long time. That's, and that's the church's wisdom. And so, okay, I think that's good. We'll save the rest for the talk later this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, this is how it happens. Thank you very much.